Good morning, everybody, and welcome to one of the first sessions at Groundswell 2023, Pastured Poultry 101, uh, chaired by myself, uh, Russ Carrington, and I'm kindly joined by Hannah Thurgood from the Inkpot Farm, uh, Nick Francis from Paddock Farm, and Matt Ailey from Hill Farm Real Food, and hopefully, before the end of the session, uh, Liz Findlay from... Uh, Nancleed Farm, all the way over in West Wales, who's unfortunately still stuck in a bit of the traffic trying to get into sight. So hopefully she'll be here um, and not miss the whole thing because she's got some really great things to say. So why we're here, really? Well, uh, there's without um, missing it, you will have seen lots of more interest in pastured poultry, and this is coming from a number of different drivers. Lots of people are talking about how useful poultry can be in our pastured ecosystems but also how important it is to feed them correctly, particularly as we, we focus on soya and how we might want to reduce the amount of soya we're using in the world to feed pigs and poultry. So what we're doing today is, is to hear from some real practitioners on the ground that are making this happen, making pastured poultry work in their farming systems. And we're going to be covering a wide range of topics. And, and then we're going to be breaking out to hear from you all as well. Uh, hear what questions you've got and, and have some good exchange of uh, things going on. Another thing we're doing today is that you may have seen some leaflets dotted around, um, thank you Hannah, uh, pastured poultry. And this is something that we've been putting together, uh, a Pasture for Life have, have led on this. Some of you may know Pasture for Life um, as being particularly involved with grazing livestock, but more recently getting a bit more involved in pigs and poultry as well and how they can play a really important role in our, in our pastures and grasslands. So this document is, is kind of launching today, and maybe this is the official launch, ta-da. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, it's been put together with a lot of thought um, and uh, background information by, by practitioners on the ground here in the UK and taking some of the best ideas from around the world and, and providing some pointers to anyone that might want to consider starting a pastured poultry enterprise or even expanding what they currently have. And it's not written in a way that's prescriptive. It's written in a way that asks you the questions, why you're doing things, what do you need to think about, how might you approach these different problems. But we're going to delve into all of those uh, this morning. And if you haven't managed to get a copy because they're in slightly short supply, there's a few more dotted around the front here. But if you head over to the Pasture for Life stand over in the livestock section over there, they've got some more and we'll be delighted to uh, tell you more about that. So how this is going to work, we're going to have some quick introductions from each of the panel. They're going to tell us a little bit of an overview about what they're each doing. And then we're gonna, I'm going to fire out some, some key questions, some of the key topics of, of this document, and then we'll throw it open to hear from you all. And in the meantime, we've got some nice rolling slides um, of some of the pictures of, of different setups we've got on our farms um, with different uh, poultry housing and fencing and all those sort of things. So have a look at those as we're going. But we didn't want to give a death by PowerPoint to start, so it's just going to be really informal and really uh, aud lots of our audience participation and sending you all away feeling inspired and motivated to uh, get some chickens or turkeys. So without d uh, further ado, I'm going to hand over to Hannah, who will give us a quick intro to what she's up to in Lincolnshire. Morning, Groundswell. Hello, everybody. You're looking beautiful this morning. Um, so <laughs> I'm Hannah Thurgood. Home is the Inkpot Organic Farm in South Lincolnshire. Uh, we started off as 18 acres and have grown over the last few years to 130 acres. And we do, we're a permaculture and a regenerative farm demonstration farm. Um, and we have mob grazing beef cattle, Lincoln Reds. We have a couple of hundred sheep that we mob lamb. And, um, but we also have 100 laying hens and we do 100, 150 turkeys for Christmas. So on the smaller scale of things, but all direct sales. So, yeah. Uh, Nick. Hello, uh, I'm Nick Francis from Paddock Farm in Warwickshire. Um, <coughs> I'm a first generation farmer, set up in 2009 with my brother John. Um, initially we were pig specialists. Um, we've always been sort of motivated by trying to produce good food, so direct sell everything that we produce. Um, and over the last sort of five years have brought quite a lot of extra diversity onto our farm, so we would now have um, about 200 head of um, mob grazed cattle. Um, we have a 300 bird um, egg laying um, 
Enterprise as part of an Eggmobile. And uh, we also have a No Dig Market Garden. Um, <coughs> and we um, have a butchery and distribution business supplying um, both uh, retail markets and also um, direct to restaurants around London and Cotswolds. Hi folks, I'm Matt Aidley. Um, we farm in Cheshire. I farm with my parents and three, uh, two of my brothers, three of us. Um, we are mainly dairy. We do beef as well and um, everything's sold direct to customer. We sell raw milk, raw kefir, cultured ghee, raw cheese and beef. Beef is a side product of the dairy herd. We keep all the, uh, the, the bull calves and the, any surplus females go into the beef program. Um, everything's sold direct to customer. The... Um, the egg enterprise is sort of very much um, integrated in the grassland with, with the cattle and the, the grass enterprise um, as a, a way of cycling the nutrients and stacking another enterprise on the same land base, really. Um, so we're very focused on just providing high quality food and selling that direct to customers. Um, and that's about it, I think. Brilliant. Thanks very much, panel. So um, we'll get straight into some uh, key topics, um, which you may have sort of seen summarised in the, in the document, if you've managed to see a copy. But I think one of the first things uh, when you're setting out on a, a poultry enterprise is, is where to source your stock. And um, there's lots of different ways of doing that. So I wonder if we'll just quickly hear from each of the panellists how they actually do that and what they look for when they're trying to find uh, their birds in the first instance. So I have two different types of bird to source. We have the, the hens and the turkeys. Um, we are certified organic, so obviously we need to find um, certified organic suppliers. So we actually, I actually go all the way down to Devon to sort of get for our point of lay because there's um, organicpoultries.co... Is it organic? Pullets, thank you, yeah, <laughs> .co .uk. Um, And so I get mine from, from them there. Um, but we do breed some of our own as well. We keep um, a cockerel, um, so like in Flockdown, we had groups of 25 hens with a cockerel each. And so we do that for a welfare point of view, that um, you, know, you can see the cockerels interacting with the hens and they behave very differently. So all our eggs are fertile. And we do have a little army of broody hens. So when any, anyone any goes broody, we can just pop some of our own eggs underneath there and source our own. So that's my favourite way to do it. But every now and then we need to you know, replenish the whole flock, um, get a new lot in, so we'll, we'll go there. And then for our turkeys, we have been getting them from um, Rutland Organic. Um, been doing that since we started. They're great. Um, um, but I am looking more now at seeing how we can do our own. And it, we had a little experiment this year that um, when I went to pick up our second batch of turkeys, there were some eggs that had pipped but not hatched. So they would have been you know, thrown away. And I'd got a broody hen at home. So I said, well, just chuck them in the box. Let's give them a go. Let's see what happens. So we had seven eggs. Didn't think anything was going to happen with them. Popped them under the broody. And in the morning, there were five turkeys sitting there very happily with this very, very proud and very scary mum. Um, and so, and comparing the two batches, you know, the five with the broody mum and the, the main batch that are under the heat lamps and the electric hens and the feed and getting everything they technically need, you can really see the difference in the welfare and the happiness of the ones that are under the fierce mum and the ones that are under the lights. And so I kind of, I would really like to move to a point where we have this, you know, full kind of bank of broodies that have all got their, their batch of um, mums. And in terms of true sustainability, you, you know, you've got the welfare side of it, but you've also got the true sustainability side of it. You know, we have no heat lamps there. We have, there's no electricity. There's very low input costs. And, um, and I believe we're going to get much more resilient turkeys from those that have kind of been taught a few life skills as well. So that's where I'd like to go with it. But we'll see if it's, you know, trying to convince the ones to be broody at the right time might be an issue. But we'll, we'll see. We'll play with it next year. So, so um, <coughs> we, when we set up our pastoral poultry enterprise, we wanted to try and be um, relatively efficient in ways that, we had control over and um, we felt that sourcing the right genetics for a productive bird was probably quite a, quite a good start and something we could really easily control and so we buy what is uh, a fairly uh, conventional laying bird um, from a company called Country Fresh Pullets which supply 
big ag, often in multiples of 30,000, but they will supply um, multiples of 50. We generally buy um, between 100 and 300 at a time. We look to restock um, once a year, um, and we're using... Um, we've actually got two different variants. We've got a white egg layer called a decalb white, which is um, a, a very prolific layer. And then we've got um, a brown egg layer called a high line. Um, we find them both really good. In interestingly, and uh, talking to the supplier, the, the decalb white is um, one of the most um, productive and prolific egg layers um, gl globally. And in obviously in this country, we are more familiar with the brown egg, whereas um, on, a, on a global scale, um, white eggs tend to be um, preferred and most commonly used. And so apparently there's been more... Um, investment and work done on the genetics of the of the white egg layers and the brown and so uh you know it's the marginal gains and for us it makes no difference that one percent more productive they might be than the browns but um we think they're really good birds and they're quite a bit smaller than the browns which um does mean they have lower maintenance requirements and need less less feed for the eggs they produce yeah, so we, um, we're currently breeding about half of our own replacements. The half we buy come from the same place as Hannah mentioned, organic pullets. They're the only people, after trying various ones, they're the only people we trust to rear pullets for us. They're reared out free range. They know how to forage when they come. Um, but we're, we've been really focused over the last few years trying to breed up some productive strains of good utility birds, and there's virtually none of these good old strains left, but we've brought quite a few together. Most of them have been disappointing, but we've got some good ones and we've bred up from them. And we're now at a stage where we're happy with the production of them and um, we're hoping next year we can get the logistics worked out to be breeding all of our own replacements going forward. Um, they <laughs> it, it, it's, it sort of gives us a bit more independence and resilience and it doesn't feel right to be... Um, that, that so many so many of the poultry worldwide are, are bred by just something like four large corporates and um, it just brings a little bit more control. Um, we can breed our own stock, as Hannah was saying. Um, we've played around with broody hens, but for the, the numbers we're doing and the, getting the timings right, we're just working on incubators at the moment. But um, <laughs> if we had the time, we'd probably play around with broody hens a bit more. But uh, the, the focus really is getting um, getting away from buying the birds and breeding birds that are just what we want. And we're really seeing improvements every generation because um, we're selecting the best 5 to 10%. Um, and <laughs> the improvements we're seeing actually go beyond what you'd expect from selection alone. So we're pretty sure there's a pretty big epigenetic component to that in terms of the birds becoming adapted to our farming system and the, the genetics expressing themselves so much better. They're really healthy. They're just bomb-proof. And the byproduct of that is um, what we do with the cockerels, um, so these are dual purpose breeds, they're mainly for laying, but they also produce a reasonable meat bird. But obviously it's, a, it's different than what most people think of as a meat bird, so it's very much, um, not everyone would be able to have the market for that, but we're fortunate we've got a pretty good customer base who um, appreciate what, <laughs> what a real chicken does look like if you, if you tell them, and we, 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 do, we, do, we are able to sell them. Uh, I think perhaps just another thing to add um, is that I've heard some poultry producers have been struggling to get birds or point of lay birds this year I don't know if anyone else has, has found that problem and I think it's been a real shortage perhaps influenced by bird flu so it really pays to to plan ahead and and, and book your birds well in advance I would say so if you're planning something next spring kind of get get them booked in get them purchased uh, already in the autumn so once you've got your birds um, let's think about where they're going to be going into and I think most of us are kind of integrating with, with grazing livestock. And I think it's, um, we'll, we'll, let's hear a little bit more about how that works. And perhaps we'll start with you, Matt. How do you kind of work your poultry uh, behind your, your grazing cattle and in, in with the rest of your farm? Yeah, so we've got kind of two systems, really. We started off with the eggmobiles following the cows. Um, the original eggmobile we made, it's pretty big. It's 10 foot by 27 foot. So on the conventional standards, we could get about 260-something hens in there. When we put the hens over to organic conversion, we could only get about 130 in there. Um, we'd since made another smaller eggmobile on the organic standards. That was about 80 hens. So we, and at that time, we were trying to scale up the hens as well because we had more demand for the eggs. So the only option we had then was to go to the, um, the portable polytunnel structures on skids. So it's a shame because it's not a welfare issue um, having, you know, 
one bird per square foot in the egg mobiles because they're outside foraging all the time. They only go in there to sleep and to lay eggs. So that, that's a shame because the egg mobile system is best. It allows you to just bring them anywhere on the farm and follow the cattle wherever they need to go. So the, um, the polytunnel system, so we, we use the eggmobile system following the cows, but then we have a, a separate group or groups of poultry on the polytunnel systems, and they have their own sort of set block of land for the year, and they just rotate around that, which might include multiple paddocks, so we just have to be a little bit flexible in terms of the grazing. Um, it still works well, and it's probably a more labour efficient way of managing a bigger group of hens. Um, but yeah, um, that, that's, that's how we do it anyway. Great. Nick? Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, so our um, chickens are housed in an, in an eggmobile that we, that we built. Um, we've built a couple of these. Um, we've, we've followed the Joel Salatin blueprint, which I think is, is excellent. Um, in the first version that we built, um, we did exactly as Joel Sal Salatin described, and he's very particular and says, you know, I've spent years developing this. Don't think you're going to improve it in the first go. Just do as I say. And so we did as he said, um, but I don't think he has the same problems with fox predators that we have. And in the first night, foxes came up through the slatted, through the gaps in the slatted floor and um, bit off several um, chicken feet. Um, so we had to amend that quite quickly, and we've now got a mesh floor version. Um, which is um, fox-proof, and in the in the second version, we've also um, <coughs> invested in uh, quite a, quite a good um, nesting box system. So it's uh, supplied by a company called SKA, and um, it's it's what they call group nests. So um, there is space in our eggmobile for 300 um, chickens to lay their eggs in a day, and the eggs all roll into the center of the conveyor belt and then roll out the back of the out the back of the eggmobile. Um, and really importantly, this um, nesting system has uh, what they call auto-exclusion gates. So on a timer, uh, which is powered by 24 volts batteries on a solar panel, um, every evening um, some uh, small steel gates um, exclude the chickens from sitting in the nests, um, which prevents them from uh, roosting and sleeping there and uh, mucking in the nesting boxes producing mucky eggs, which was a real issue that we had um, with the first version of the Eggmobile because we had no way of excluding the chickens from the nests um, in the evening. And that was, for us, that was a real game changer. Straight away, we were getting um, clean eggs every day, easily. Um, Matt, Matt has uh, alluded to the challenges of satisfying um, the egg inspector regulations. I don't know how much we want to go into this, but... Um, as many people will be familiar, um, there are certain um, <coughs> regulations to satisfy if one is to either have more than 300 chickens or sell uh, their eggs in any way other than direct to end user. And that would include, um, that was, uh, that would include prohibiting selling to um, restaurants. Um, we are quite troubled by this because the very concept of our Eggmobile is that it uh, is portable and we wanted it to be towable by a quad and we want it to be able to follow our cattle. And um, there are certain um, rules on the amount of floor space required per bird in the regulations and that is um, you need uh, what no more than nine birds per square meter. Which means that in order to satisfy the regulations, you can never house more than uh, 120-ish birds in, a, in an Eggmobile that you can tow with a quad bike. Um, ours is towable with a quad bike and can house 300, which means, that, um, stri which means that we're not supposed to sell to anybody other than end users. Um, I'll say no more as to uh, <laughs> what happens to some of the eggs. Um, but... These regulations are quite frustrating because uh, they are not relevant to the welfare of the birds. I can see how in a, in a large-scale system they have their place, but they're just not fit for purpose in a pasture-poultry-type system where the chickens go in at dusk, 
they're on an auto timer, they're out at dawn, uh, they literally go into the, into the eggmobile to use the roosts and to lay their eggs. And every other part of the regulations, we can satisfy no problem. It's just this floor space issue, which, uh, which, is, which is a real challenge. Yeah, great, thank you. I think and that's a pattern, isn't it, with a regulation that comes up quite a lot, that regulations are often um, designed for kind of slipstream monocultural systems. And as we, as we move to more regenerative systems and resilient systems, we want to be stacking those enterprises. And resilient systems are often quite complex systems. We might have multiple enterprises, a lot of diversification. And that's definitely the case at the ink pot. So we have cows, sheep, turkeys, and chickens. And um, so we don't have a kind of a one model of how we, how we move the chickens and where the chickens are going to be at various points because there's different relationships with the different animals. So when <coughs> we have the 18-acre home field and then we rent another 110 acres in to six, you know, under six different landlords across a various different villages. So I, I'm not taking the chickens over to you know two villages away. They're staying on the home field. So when the cows are at home mobbing the home field, then the chickens follow behind them. But when the sheep are at home, because I don't know if any of you have sheep and the, you know the varying relationships with electric fencing, but um, the sheep love the chicken food. The the chicken food kills the, chick the sheep because they bloat on it and they die. And so we, when the sheep are mobbing around the field or at home, then the chickens are, out, are not out in the main field. So they do kind of tend to sit in one bit under the trees for a while until the, until the cows come or to move them around. But their houses are all mobile. So we use um, old livestock trailers. So I'm always scouting eBay for the knackered old livestock trailers that are no longer roadworthy. Um, and there's a caravan that you'll see that comes up that that is our favorite one I think the caravan and the, it's the chickens favorite one because um, we didn't strip it out we've left the drawers and we've left the shelves and we've left everyone in there and currently there's about seven um, pretending to be broody hens sitting in various shelves and drawers in the caravan because they love it so much and in flock down it's so much nicer because they've got the windows and they've got little air vents and it's you know they ladders all over the place so yeah that's that's the the like kind of five-star accommodation um, and then as a brooder, I use an old horse box, an old three and a half ton horse box, because it's off up the ground and, um, and, it, and can be completely sealed. And so that's where the turkeys are. And when we get a batch of, you know, bought in um, day old chicks, chicken chicks, then we'll brood them in there as well. So that's quite effective. Um, so the chickens are sometimes following the cows. Sometimes they're not. The turkeys, they start off in the, in the brooder system, which is static. Poor old horse box doesn't move anymore. Um, and then they get moved into livestock trailers. And around the edge of the 18-acre home field, we've got a 15-metre wide strip of 4,000 trees that we planted 13 years ago. <laughs> and so we've got this route all the way around the field. And so the turkeys are our woodland managers. So they get moved on each week. Um, you know, they're around a poultry netting in that system. And, and I, I think that's the thing that makes a massive flavour difference to our turkeys is, is the kind of the noise of happiness when you open the doors and they've moved into a fresh area and they lose themselves in the undergrowth because that woodland area doesn't get grazed at any other point. The trees are still too small for any of the grazers to go through. Um, and so they are foraging a huge amount of seeds and berries and rose hips and, and insects and dead flower heads and all sorts. And, and it, but they also do, do a fantastic treat to the young trees that are going around. And so I, mean, I might be steering into food here. But in terms of kind of farm management size as well, we, we're kind of Luddites de deliberately. We try and farm beyond oil. So we do have a knackered old farm truck that does pull around the livestock trailers occasionally. But other than that, we don't have a tractor and um, try and manage everything by hand, which is ridiculous, obviously. But <coughs> it means <coughs> when you're looking at these 4,000 young trees that need to be pruned and the, the hedge side that's very big needs to be sorted, when the turkeys are just in this kind of, you know, 100 metres square, whatever size it is, I'm rubbish at figuring that size out, that area, kind of the area of this tent, actually, for a week, then um, it means I can then get clear access to those trees for that week that I can side prune and I can sort out that bit of hedge that week and I don't have to worry about all the rest of it. So it's that kind of human scale farming that I think is, you know, really brings in the resilience to, to farming. So, so, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Hannah. And, and there's lots of, uh, we've already mentioned a few different kind of designs of, of, of hen houses. Um, and there's a lot out there. I think it's really important to think about what your needs are as a, as a farmer, as a user. 
are you going to be organic or not, and, and the implications of, of those different regulations. Um, and, and getting that clear before you build something is, is really important. There are lots of kind of resources and ideas online to how you might do that and some of the designs we've talked about. Um, another regulation just to kind of mention at, at this point, if you're soil association organic, you're required to have 5% natural cover in the range of your poultry. And natural cover, according to the standards, doesn't include tall grass or thistles or docks. It's about encouraging um, you to keep your poultry in an agroforestry system, which, which Hannah's clearly doing. But if you're following cattle in open pastures with your poultry, that can be a little bit more challenging. And so really have a think about if you do want to do that and you're with the Soil Association, how you might uh, comply with that particular standard. It's quite a new standard as well, so it's, it's causing quite a bit of adjustment needed. But um, anyway, you know, very good for, for birds to have more shade and shelter and a more interesting range. Um, we've, um, we'll, we will come on to, to feed a little bit more. I just wanted to perhaps cover off um, predation a little bit more. Um, because that also influences how you might design your, your chicken housing or uh, poultry housing. And, um, and Matt's got something quite exciting going on on that front. Um, but tell us, Matt, what you've got and how you manage your uh, pr predators. Yeah, so we have three um, Marema livestock guardian dogs. Um, so when we started off with the eggmobiles, it worked well for a period of time, and then the local foxes found us. Um, we tried putting nets up, moving that round. They still somehow, whatever the kick on it, got in or over or under the nets. I'd heard about the idea of um, the using using the dogs, so we, we went and bought one livestock guardian dog followed by a second. Um, fantastic, really helps. So we, the, the system we sort of run is that the hens in the polytunnels, they're behind nets. There's one or two dogs within the nets with them all the time. That's most of the hens. And then we have one or two dogs free running at any one time as well, and they sort of keep an eye on the eggmobiles, which are generally sort of rotated around the grazing. We don't do anything silly like leave them miles away next to the woods, but they're generally in the 100, 150 acres nearest the farm. Um, so generally we rotate. We could probably do with an extra dog, really, just to rotate them so they don't get worn out. And you do need a dog that's really right mentally to be able to do that free running and watch the eggmobiles in a wider area. Um, but we, we found that's... That's, that's worked really well. Um, do you want me to talk a bit more about... Are you going to advertise your uh, puppies? Well, I wasn't going to. <laughs> 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 but, um, no, we, we found they, they, they've really helped. Um, we don't worry at all about predation. And um, they... You have to get the rearing period right, but it's not a case of intensive training. It's just a case of putting the dog in the right situations at the right time, socialising it to the livestock, socialising to people socialising it you know with other dogs and the way they've been bred um, for thousands of years up in the hills in Italy living with the sheep keeping the wolves away they basically they just thrive off having a human family an animal family and a, a, a canine family ideally but they, they they're very adaptable but you just have to get the a few things right in the early stages and Hannah how are you approaching predators well, we've just struck a deal this morning. <laughs> we've just got... A, like, <laughs> I've just had pennies last night. Oh, so you haven't actually got any left? <laughs> or, or, or no, no. Pennies sold. Like, okay. Pennies. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, grand, a grandchild of mine. Oh, yeah. It's all in the family. So, yeah, I've got very exciting news for the kids when I get home. Um, but I, I find moving, moving the animals really makes a big difference. Um, I, I don't know. There's lots of different theories about how foxes hunt and which ones go for a mass murder and which ones just, you know... but. I definitely notice there's a difference that um, if you're moving your animals regularly, the foxes don't like that. Um, you know, the kind of the theory that I've heard that seems to match is that a fox will come and scout out the kind of the territory one day and then um, come back to hunt the next day. And, um, and if it's all, if the coast is clear, then they'll come back. And so by moving stuff around, you know, it, it doesn't have to be moving the whole system sometimes, just moving a few things around. That puts them on edge and they don't like it. So... Um, we have electric fencing as well, but you know it's not perfect. We've we've lost a few hens this year, and we've lost turkeys, you know, fully grown turkeys in the past, um, and we've we've lost fully grown geese in the past as well. So it's something you do really have to watch. And and with turkeys, there is a big difference. I think it's worth kind of giving a cautionary note with turkeys because people tend to think, oh, they're just bigger chickens and they behave the same, and they do not. So anyone here who's got turkeys will know the headache that you can have with them sometimes of 
if you this is why we're moving to the livestock guardian si dog system is the the headache of putting the turkeys away every night you know if you're if you're choosing to have truly free range turkeys you have to be there at the right time every day to put them away and sometimes they just have the wind up them and it takes you know twice the amount of time that you need to be and as a solo mum you know farmer then that's always the time when the kids need to have food or need to be at a club or somewhere so there's a lot of you know a lot of changing lifestyle to be at home an hour before sunset to make sure you're there to put the turkeys away else you will be up on a big roof trying to pull turkeys down off your neighbour's Dutch <laughs> barn and, you know, because they're not the most intelligent, but they are very inquisitive. So, so yeah, it's, a, it's not an easy job. That's so you're sure. glad turkeys are just for Christmas, really? Yeah, <laughs> there is this lovely calm that comes across the farm just at the end of December. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't have to put anything away. How nice. <laughs> and Nick, wh wh what sort of fencing system are you using to uh, keep your foxes at bay? Well... Um, when we first started with the pasture poultry, we wanted to keep it really simple and try and keep labour requirements as as, uh, as minimal as possible. So we went a bit maverick and uh, used no fences, no dogs. Uh, we just purely had the eggmobile, which had a, um, a timer on the a, a light sensor timer on the on the on the door to open at dawn and close at dusk. And sorry to make reference again to Joel Salatin, but Joel Salatin says. Uh, you might lose a few. Uh, you might lose a few to predation, but the, the the value they'll bring to your land will still be worth it, even if you end up with no birds at the end of the year. <laughs> so we almost ended up with no birds at the end of the year, <laughs> which which doesn't make for a very uh, profitable enterprise, and um, it also isn't a great story for our customers. Um, so we have changed the system slightly. Uh, and we bought a dog off Matt. Uh, we've, now <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've now got two dogs, and uh, you know, it's not it's not it's not essential to have a dog to make pasture poultry work, but it really helps. And um, we uh, have two of Matt's dogs, and they are incredible. The they we, we do also <laughs> we've gone all the way now because we also use poultry netting. Um, uh, which we move weekly. So we move the shed daily, but we move the poultry netting weekly to, to again, try and keep it relatively efficient. Um, and initially, we thought the poultry netting would serve a signif insignificant part to keep the dogs near the chickens, um, particularly when, when, or the dog when she was, when she was young. Um, and, it, and it does do that, and the chickens are really roamy. They do go a long way. Um, so we have found that the uh, electric poultry netting is uh, really, really valuable. And uh, when combined with, we put, we take the dogs out during the day. They come up to the yard, and then in the evening they go down to the chickens. And when the dogs are with the chickens, I mean, the door always does shut, but you, you don't even need to shut the door. The, they will absolutely keep the foxes away. They're just uh, incredible. Brilliant, thanks. So let's um, move on to feed a little bit. And, and some of you might have seen this slide with some um, black soldier fly larvae um, on the screen because uh, a few farmers and organisations are trying to really see how we can use insect protein as a replacement for soya protein. But it's a real challenge um, to do things like that and to actually even see how we can even wean, wean soya out of the diets of poultry because they are the soya contains very important... Uh, Proteins that are very uh, hard to replace otherwise. And insect protein is, is one potential solution to that. So we've all been working on how we might do that. And I think it'd be good to hear um, from each of us as well what we're trying to do on that front to make our feed a more sustainable, there it is, um, a more sustainable source of uh, protein. I'll start with Nick. So, yeah, this is, this is a tricky one. So we um, buy our feed off, um, off a a big feed mill called GLW. Um, we also buy our pig feed off this feed mill and they make a really good quality soy-free pig ration, which we buy. But unfortunately, they don't currently make a soy-free chicken version. And so um, our we feed a layers pellet from GLW. So it's, uh, it's a fairly conventional layers pellet, provides a modern genotype with everything that it needs to be really productive. Um, but we are uncomfortable that 
well, it'd be lovely not to have to bite off a big meal, but we are uncomfortable that uh, it does contain soy. We have got assurances from GLW that this soy is Bone Frost Alliance certified and it isn't sourced from South America and et cetera, et cetera. But still, we would love to cut it out. And so for us, at this point, um, it's a matter of uh, trying to keep pressure on the mill. And we aren't the only farm pressuring the mill to look at um, rations for monogastrics that um, don't contain soy. And, s and so I, I believe it will come. It came about three years ago for our soy, pre soy free pig feed. Um, but uh, yeah, the truth is we're, we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, so um, we buy Lay's pellets from a, a, a big company. Uh, we're fortunate they do make up a custom um, custom made mix for us, which doesn't contain soya. Um, generally happy with the feed, although I think we lose out a little bit on production without the quality of protein for the soya. I can't remember exactly what the protein's made up with, but I think peas, beans, and lucerne are in there. Um, but generally happy with it. Um, works well. We try and, obviously as we all do, try and maximise the foraging opportunities for the birds so that they're getting a higher proportion of the diet from what they can naturally forage. Um, in the winter, we'll tip hay and compost and green and whatever for them just to, to buffer the diet a bit more there. We also occasionally have um, cultured skim milk or whey from the dairy spare, so we feed that, but that's more on, on, on an ad hoc basis, really, um, rather than being a regular everyday thing, but it's usually through most of the summer we have something to them most days on that. We also feed a scratch feed in the afternoon of uh, oats or oat screenings, depending what we can get at the time. Um, just think that's nice for the bird behaviour and a bit more variety in the diet. I think in an ideal world, we would be working on feeding just hard, hard grains if we were able to buy grains direct from an organic arable farmer, perhaps, um, and source our protein sources on farm. So combination of what the birds are finding when they're foraging, if we can make the dairy you know, buy produce, work on a consistent basis and possibly some soldier fly larvae or a wormery or, or some kind of other thing. And to that end, we're, we're quite sort of keen on keeping some hard scratch food in for all of our birds, including our young chicks. As soon as they're big enough, we'll be throwing that. They have growers pellets, soy-free growers pellets, but we'll also make sure we throw them a scratch feed every day of mixed grains. So at the moment, they're getting a mixture of canary seed, linseed and um, oats and I think some hemp seed as well, just to give them, get them developing their gizzards and um, you know, hopefully genetically program them in later life or the future progeny to be more able to process a hard diet. And we're taking a similar view on that as we did when we transitioned our cows across to 100% dairy. That very much starts with the breeding and the young stock and getting them, you know, whilst our cows were mostly grass fed to start with, you, know, you start with your young stock and um, it's amazing how quickly a herd or a flock can adapt. So we're hoping we can apply the same sort of principles to the poultry to going forward allow us to use cheaper ingredients and simpler ingredients in the ration without losing too much production. Great. Hannah? Yeah, I think the food thing's really interesting. And um, I think as people are waking up to the soya stuff, um, it's giving us an opportunity to get more creative. Um, I think when we look at our systems, if we're looking at kind of creating closed loop systems, we can be missing quite a few tricks of what's available on the farm already. Um, and so, you know, the reason that we like to follow chickens behind cows is because the, the as I'm sure most of you know, but just in case anyone's missing this bit, is that the flies, the golden um, dung um, flies will come and um, lay their eggs in the in the cow pats and then a few days later you've got them hatching into lovely little squirmy maggots which is truly disgusting but chickens and turkeys are and um, and they love that and the kids love hearing about that when they come and do school visits about what actually your chickens are eating and what really is in your egg kind of thing but there's a free organic um, local supply of protein and and there's so much more we could create on the farm ourselves as well and you know not without having an arable side of things there's you know there's much more we could put in so on small scale systems it's great there's things like putting logs down in you know in your chicken foraging system and then every now and then turning the log over and look there's all those lovely insects for them to be eating so you can kind of 
extend that. So, I mean, we've been doing a very con conventional, organic kind of, you know, just buying in feed. And but it's we've been really pushed um, in terms of the finances of that. But also, not wanting the soya. There's a, a kind of a funny com um, relationship between organic and soya that I don't know how you're finding that. But that the you need to have a s only a, you're limited under organic standards about the proportion of your feed that can be protein. And so, soya is about the only thing that's dense enough to be able to do that. So. We are moving more into feeding straights, um, and it's funny as I kind of su um, sussed out last night where we were going to be. I noticed Cope Seeds are just over there, and they're our local seed um, company. And I get my um, I so they have they use two local seed processors to us within two villages of us, and um, when they're screening their oat seeds, then we have their oat screenings. Um, so. Um, so stuff that's not good enough to see, there's still plenty of feed in it, and that's what we give our turkeys when they're on their fa fattening rations. So I've extended that option now to, I'm just, I've been meaning to go and pick up some barley from another farm for a while. So Cope Seeds and I, we've had a you know, few conversations about sourcing barley, wheat, peas, beans, all from their, their screenings. So it's, you know, sometimes you get a, lo a, a load of dust and stuff in there as well, but there's still a lot of food and it's a lot cheaper. And it's that waste product that we can use as well. And with that, what I want to be doing is doing more soaking of the feed, so fermenting it, um, whether you're using water or apple cider vinegar. I know a lot of people, and quite a few people in here, I'm kind of spotting faces through the lights, are playing with this as well. And that takes away that problem of the kind of digestibility of the really hard food. The, um, if you, the most simple system that I've seen so far is just soaking that, that you know, the straight ga grains in rainwater, not tap water, but for three days and just adding more water as it needs it. And it gets that nice kind of musty fermenting smell. And that adds so many nutrients and so, you know, to for the chicken feed without us having to do anything more other than the labour of pouring a bit of water in and it's heavier obviously to carry around and so there's things like that that we can be more imaginative with the the other side of it that I think we're especially if those of you that are already producing meat there's a massive protein <laughs> thing here that um, you know if we talk to kind of grandparents I've had a few conversations just here over the you know last night and this morning about people talking about their grandparents feeding their chickens, you know, rotten meat, roadkill, maybe not roadkill from grandparents, but, but you know, maggots. And, and what an opportunity we have there, whether it's in regulations or not. There's a, you know, it doesn't, there's legal things, definitely. But um, I noticed in flock down, we, lots of people were talking about hanging lettuces in their, in their, you know, in their chicken houses for the chickens to eat off. Well, I thought about that. I thought, that's great. That's lovely. I don't particularly like lettuce. Mm. Um, but <laughs> we did have a load of sheep ribs that came back from the butcher. Now, those had never gone into the kitchen. So it wasn't actually a, you know, coming out of the kitchen in terms of a waste food. I spoke to my organic inspector, and she said there's not actually... She couldn't find something saying you couldn't specifically feed your chickens that. So we hung a few sheep ribs that still had quite a lot of meat on them. And, um, and the chickens absolutely loved it. So... Where it sits legally and within regulations, maybe it's time that the regulations need to catch up with what's practical and what's sensible and closing loops, using waste products. And there, you know, a lot of us will have an available, you know, set of protein of all sorts of bits when we're looking at nose to tail on our carcasses of bits that, you know, aren't very easy to use that the, that the poultry can use. So, and um, on the kind of disgusting side of it, the, if anyone has had turkeys or, you know, that... They do fight, and they fight to the death, and then they eat each other. And so it is that part of their <laughs> natural behaviour. It doesn't happen loads. It's you know, it's when they hit a certain amount of testosterone. I'm kind of giving turkeys a bit of a bad view here, I think. <laughs> but they're not these kind of cute, cuddly things. They they can be, but um, but they they're not that kind of affectionate with each other. Put it that way. And so it is within their natural behaviour to be. You know, they are omnivores. So let's work with the natural behaviours of the animals that we're working with, and feed. You know look at the most natural source of protein that they would be having in the wild. So. Great. And just to say, uh, beta bugs that are, are sort of trying to trial and pioneer the black soldier fly, I think I've got a stand here. So if anyone's interested in that, go and have a chat to them. And, and it's a real shame Liz isn't here because she's actually growing her own feed on her farm in Wales and she's really trying to discover how that happens. But if, we get to, if I get to introduce her before the end, then you can all come and ask her if you've got more questions. Um, I'm conscious of time because I'd love to kind of throw out to the floor, but there's a couple of more topics I want to discuss. And, and 
we could talk a lot about kind of health and well-being, but quickly to talk about um, bird flu because that's become a real challenge for uh, poultry producers, especially poultry producers that are free-range organic, having their their birds outside. Um, so it's it's a it's, it's quite a big challenge to overcome, but maybe turning it into some useful opportunities from time to time. Let's hear from each of our panel how they're dealing with uh, bird flu. Start with Matt. Yeah, so what we do during the uh, lockdown period, lockdown, whatever they call it, um, we put Harris panels up, building site panels, with a net over the top. So they've got an outside area that meets compliance because they are in an enclosed area while birds can't get to them. Um, but it's still wrong, and it's, it's not, you know, I think all of us are, are doing this because we believe or we know that the birds are healthier and it's better for welfare if they are free-ranging. Um, I'm trying not to be too controversial here. Um, I really struggle with the idea that you've got to shut them inside to keep them healthy. I think there's a bigger discussion that needs to be had surrounding immunity and welfare. I've spoken to numerous vets and inspectors who've seen some real train crashes in terms of health and welfare during the lockdown periods. Um, it, it's not a way of keeping the birds healthy. I think we need to be talking about how we can boost our birds' immunity through breeding, feeding, and the environment they're kept in. Um, yeah, I just think it's something we need to be having a conversation about. I don't see any change coming from higher up, if you like, because the lobbying power is with the bigger producers who I suspect are quite happy to keep the birds inside because maybe they've got no immune system. Um, but I really feel it could be a threat to the whole you know, regenerative, small-scale, pastured poultry movement because if we are being told to keep our birds inside for nearly half a year, which is what it's been the last couple of years, it could be argued, should we be calling them pastured or free-range altogether? And again, I don't see the big industry arguing because that would remove our ability to differentiate in the marketplace. So I don't know what the solution is, but I really think we need to be talking about this a lot more. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> that, um, it's really, really frustrating having to put them away. I, I totally agree that they, you know, their immunity is better when they're out and about. And there's a few kind of interesting sides to this. That um, in January, when my birds were all locked up, I went over to the um, to Welney, which is a big um, a wetland water system. Uh, you know, huge reserve, loads and loads of wild birds, migratory birds. So all the stuff that we've been told, they're the they're the real hot spot. That's the problem. And they have thousands of overwintering migratory birds, like thousands and thousands of them. It's huge on the used washes. And I asked them about how they were coping with bird flu. And they said every, every dead bird that they get, they have to take off to be tested for bird flu straight away. And um, they had had no cases of bird flu that year at all. You think, well, that's the thing that we've been told we've got to be really, really careful of. But they're all healthy and outdoors and living their best life, you know. So there's something in that. I think I think we need to kind of be pushing back against the, the regulations without being too controversial and saying, look, you know, it, at what point are we going to be cl calling it endemic and that we just have to get on with it? Because I find the really scary side of it is that there is a lot of regional variation in terms of, or kind of inspector variation in terms of what the regulations actually mean. So and it, we're all on what, uh, pasture, pe um, poultry, WhatsApp group, and I know a lot of you on here are, and you're all very welcome to join it. And, um, and we get varying stories across the country of what people have been told. So some people were told by their inspectors they can carry on moving their their hen mobiles, that as long as they're contained within them, that they were allowed to keep moving them. Well, I was told, and my interpretation of it was that the the um, infected poo stays um, infectable, it stays live for six weeks. And so that's, you know, you're moving them onto a potentially infected area. So that's a variation. But there was also um, a, a case down in Devon where friends were told that if, if they had a case of bird flu on their farm, their entire farm would be shut down. All their enterprises would be shut down. So overnight, they sold all, you know, they, they rehomed all their chickens and got rid of them, which was brilliant kind of flexibility and maneuverability. But that's crippling in terms of that kind of squashing of the Regenag systems or, or, you know, of these, if we're kind of, if that's the kind of message that are getting through to farmers that we need to just get rid of our chickens or that our whole farms will be shut down. You know, I think we really need to be 
questioning it and having these conversations, just like with the feed, just like with the egg production and kind of saying, are these regulations fit for purpose anymore? So. Um, yeah, I don't disagree at all. Um, our, our system's slightly different because we've got a market garden on the farm. Um, the, the concept, ev even without um, the avian flu, is, is such that uh, come the winter, the birds move into um, the polytunnels. Um, and then uh, they serve a really valuable function, um, providing lots of manure for us to grow um, vegetables in the next year. So it's a, a really nice way of turning a challenge into a positive and um, a nearly really nice way of sharing some infrastructure between, between the enterprises. There. And, and market gardening is, 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 is amazing, but really hard. And if you can uh, share some of the infrastructure costs between enterprises, it seems to make an awful lot of sense. Brilliant. And, and just to say as well, in Scotland at the moment, there's a slightly different um, requirements for, for bird flu, not required to lock down the birds, but just increase biosecurity measures. And that seems a far more pragmatic uh, way of going about it. But we'll have to watch this space and see how it goes. But it does seem that bird flu is something that's somewhat here to stay uh, most winters. Um, I'm really conscious of time. We've only got 10 minutes left. And I was going to just cover off um, supply chains and marketing, but I think we'll, we'll perhaps skip over that unless anyone's got a burning question about it but um, you can grab these people later and understand how they how they sell uh, their poultry produce um, if you want to know more or, or, or look, look up online but I wanted to give you all chance to ask any questions is there anything we've missed or you've got some burning questions um, you might want to ask the panel about how they're dealing with particular things uh, we've got a, a, a roaming mic um, and we'll need to make sure all questions are, are heard in the microphone for the recording for those that can't make it here today has anyone got a burning question? First one down here in the front. And then we'll come over here. Thank you. Hello. Hey. How do you deal with goshawks? Anyone want that? Because you can't shoot them. Sorry, was that goshawks? Yep. Uh, we don't have them, as far as we know. We have buzzards, but never been an issue. I think the dogs help. We do have young birds there. Um, which they seem to keep an eye on, but we normally have a dog in with them, and it's never a problem. We don't have goshawks either, but we have buzzards and kites. And um, But I think the fact that with the mobile homes, they can often get underneath them, and so as long as chickens can get to cover, they're pretty good at getting to cover, but I don't have goshawks, so I don't know. I'm sorry, we don't either. <laughs> I'm jealous that you've got goshawks, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> no, okay, no, I'm not, no. <laughs> Question over here. Hi, uh, with the great way we can manipulate these poultry using genetics I was, like matt was obviously working on his birds to make them more um genetically coping with his farm um the the ration that we have our birds on is is the, and the dependency on soya um can we not look at possibly looking at the commercial strains of birds that are out there and looking at changing the amino acid dependency is do you, do you think it's based on on the fact that we've been pushing these birds really hard for like 50, 60 years, that they, or do you think they, all strains of birds are so dependent on the soya amino acids? Do you want to take that one, Matt? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, that's what we're seeing, I think, with the, the dual purpose utility breeds that we're working with. Um, it's tricky because all, all birds have been fed layers pellets for how many years? So it, it takes a few years to sort out what, um, Genetics will cope with the harder feeds and which won't, but completely agree. It's something we should be selecting for. And I think that applies in all sorts of livestock because generally the best, supposedly the best genetics are fed the best feed. Whereas we should be looking at what feed is available in a certain location and breeding livestock to suit that, which is probably how most of the breeds originated in the first place. Um, welcome, Liz. <laughs> you must have had a horrendous drive. What time did you leave? Quarter to three. Oh, ouch. <laughs> well, it would be rude of us not to not to ask you a few questions quickly um, and for the audience to, to see who you are and come and grab you later. But yeah. can you give us a really brief overview of what you're doing in West Wales and perhaps cover off how you're um, doing feed, growing your own, and, and the, the, the new genetics that you're breeding? Okay. Okay. So um, I'm... I'm so yeah, I'm close and close. Okay. Um, I'm Liz Findlay. I farm across in West Wales with my son. We have two parcels of land. Um, we have the poultry, composting system, horticultural, polytunnels, 
um, at our Aberystwyth farm. We have a farm further south where we have beef, um, sheep, we grow arable for the poultry, and we do field scale veg. And we, um, we've, we started off with organic poultry back in 99, um, when the organic standards were, you know, you were still synthetic amino acids, um, buying in commercial pullets, and we've moved all the way through rearing our own Dale chicks um, from 2005. Um, 2007, we put in a mill and mix, mix that as we could grow our own grain and um, buy in fee grain from um, Pembrokeshire organic farmers. And um, a certified Demeter were, were organic, certified with the Biodynamic Association. Um, so we try and keep as close a system as we can. Uh, so we've moved from the, the last 23 years to be breeding our own um, poultry. We brought in some breeding stock from the OTZ um, breeding program in Germany, where they've specifically been selecting and they've got a breeding program because they get much more support from the German government. It's, m it's marketed, it's funded, um, it's a comprehensive breeding program. It's all there online. Um, it's not just poultry, they're keen to, to breed dual purpose everything. Um, so we brought some eggs in from there. We've crossed those with some of our leghorns. We've crossed them with Bressay, Bressay birds and we're evolving our own breeding stock with the idea um, that um, yeah, we, we can avoid uh, the, high the need for high protein in the feeds um, and that we can uh, work with uh, wheat and peas and, and oats, we grow naked oats, and, um, and the forage that grows on the pasture and the way we manage the pasture, um, you know, making it very insect um, rich and, um, uh, and allowing the birds to forage. Um, as much as they can. Uh, so that's essentially an overview of, of what we're doing and where we're trying to go. And, and certainly um, the, the dual purpose, so the end of lays go onto the table, uh, there's goes table birds, we, get, we kill anything. The, the, the end of lays do about 1.67, eight kilos, the end of lay, the cockles that we hatch and rear on, they'll do about two kilos at about 18, 20, 24 weeks. Um, there's a good demand for the, the meat, it's different. We, we kill it, we hang it for two weeks, um, and the feedback is always, you know, this is chicken, like, you know, this is so different, and this is what we want to be buying. Um, egg production, obviously, you, you can't have it all. The, that is the problem with the genetics in, in the commercial birds. They, they bred for production, and particularly production in the pullet year as well. So we always molt our birds, always have done, and we always do, because the second, when they come back after a molt, in that uh, second laying year, you can feed them that lower ration. Uh, they don't really don't need anything more than about 16%. They're laying less eggs, like 75% less production than you get in the pullet lay. But, you know, I still think it's worthwhile doing that, and they most certainly with the dual purpose, and you get a heavier bird and a heavier hen. Um, so that's a sort of overview of what we're doing. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Liz. Loads of interesting things there. We've got just time for two more questions. There's a chat behind you, Christine. Thank you. Hi there, and um, thanks very much. Very interesting. As a, um, a predominantly cattle farmer, I'm very interested in the um, pasture poultry concept, but um, how do I make sure that it's not a labour-intensive hobby and it's an economic model. I mean, I'm, I, I guess I'm, what I'm asking is what sort of scale and, um, you know, you know how, do, how do we make it financially viable? Um, because it seems quite, quite labor intensive compared to, you know, what we're used to cattle farming. Yeah, good question. Do you want to pick that one, Nick? So uh, I think uh, the first thing you should do is go listen to Richard Perkins because he has nailed a really efficient system and we sort of model a lot of the way that we work on the Richard Perkins type concept um, and we try and keep our labour requirements to an absolute minimum so uh, and, it, and it's it's not a lot of uh, not a lot of labour required so it, broadly 45 minutes per day um, is required to move the egg mobile feed the chickens and collect the eggs and then once a week, it's about an hour and a half because we have to set the uh, reset the, the netting. 
But what I would also say, and uh, we haven't really covered, is uh, it's a really profitable little enterprise. And so um, the overheads required in setting up aren't massive. Uh, the running costs and overheads throughout the year aren't massive. And, and it's, it, we find it very lucrative. And we do direct sales, so we get £8.25 a tray of eggs. But it's one of the most profitable enterprises on our farm. And we recently invested in a load of um, replacement heifers. And uh, um, my partner just said to me, why won't you just build another eggmobile? It's so much more profitable. And, and there's certainly a lot to be said for that. Great. We've got time for one more question. Anyone uh, burning to ask? Oh, over here. Sorry, Christine. Uh, it's not really a question. It's more about um, talking about protein and feed and things. When I farmed in Canada a few years back, and I also seen it in the Philippines, the way they were managing to supplement protein for, for laying birds and meat birds was using azola. So I'm curious if anyone's tried to use azola. In here, it's, a, it's essentially a plant, it's an aquatic plant that you can grow in ponds and pools, and it grows within 14 days to 21 days. And it's a massive, like, 19, 94% protein in it. I don't know if anyone's tried it here. Amy, do you want to talk about what you, your dad does with duckweed? <laughs> Good. Sorry, Christine. So, yeah, we do have an answer to that. There is a system using duck duckweed over here. I'm not sure if it's Azola. I came across Azola in New Zealand as well. But I just heard about um, Mark Chappell. So it's Amy Chappell, um, Mark, a father and daughter farming system that they've got. Totally on the spot, but thank yeah, you. Yeah, go on, Amy. I know she can handle it. Go on. She's, she's passed it to me now. <laughs> oh, is Mark? Are you there? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Mark. Go on, Mark. So um, we're doing um, broilers. So we, you haven't talked too much about broilers, but we've we've got um, broilers. We've been this is our fourth season on broilers. Amy's been doing layers for a few years more than that. Um, and we've just experimented with the duckweed is all I can say, really. I wanted to scale it up with a pond, but bird flu issues have concerned me on that because it's obviously open water, you're into an issue there. So we've just grown it on uh, in a couple of IBCs cut off and it does grow very quickly. Uh, we've just used it in the brooder up to now to try and supplement the protein uh, at that young age when they, they really make most benefit of it. Um, and. I can't quantify its benefit because we haven't got that far really, but it, it is um, helping with the, the pro because we're soya free, I haven't pointed that out. So we're, we're soya free, we have been from the start on the, on the broilers. So. And I think the key thing to it, isn't it, that, that, that it replicates so quickly, like a Zola duckweed, that you just chuck a bit into the water, it, it doubles in a, in a day, is it? It's like in, in the good weather. Yeah. And so that, that's another thing we can really explore together. And I know um, Ragman's Lane um, it, it's a really long-standing permaculture farm. They've also noticed that their, um, their chickens predate a lot on tadpoles on the edge of their pond and a lot of duck feed. So they're another, you know, sorry, frogs, but a good, <laughs> a good protein source. Um, it just also does help with their foraging when they go out as well, if they've had duck feed. So yeah. that's a benefit for later on. Brilliant. Thanks very much for your input. I'm going to have to wrap things up. We've been a bit naughty going over slightly. But I think, as you can all see, it's a real, there's a real journey going on here. Lots of pioneering people doing lots of things to really understand how we can solve some of these problems and, and make pasture poultry really work in our farming systems, both from an environmental and a profit point of view. So um, just to remind you, there's, if you haven't managed to pick up copies of this leaflet, and there's also a longer version of the leaflet available online, uh, if you want to find that, go and find that at the Pasture for Life stand. Um, and thank you very much to the panel, to Nick, uh, Hannah, Matt and Liz especially for uh, driving so long. But I think do come and speak to us all afterwards and find out more.